Shabbat Shalom. Happy Sabbath. It is indeed a great time to be alive. We're thankful this morning that we're here and we can worship our Creator who has been so gracious to us. No one but Yahweh could have thought of a time, a portion of time we call the Shabbat. Because as I indicated earlier that the week sometimes seems like we have been in a ring, in a fight with the circumstances of our lives. And therefore, when the Sabbath comes at Friday evening, it's like the referee, Yahweh, has rang the bell. He rings the bell. And let us know it's time to sit on the chair and breathe a sigh of relief because the six rounds have gone past. And tired we have been, he said, come a while, come away and rest. So we are thankful. And this morning we come to reflect up on his word and we will do that by way of the subject this morning, bind up the testimony, bind up the testimony. And we want to look at that subject through the experience and through the work and the writings of the prophet Yeshuyahu. Yeshayahu. You know, when we anglicize these words, we miss the very context and content of what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us. How did it ever become Isaiah? I'm not sure. But his Hebrew name is Yeshayahu. We already know what Yahu means, or what Yahu means. But Yeshu is the same as Joshua or Yeshua, meaning salvation. So Isaiah means Yah is salvation. That's what it means. But they have really messed us up with the English, and so we miss the context. But Yah said, in the end time, this time, I'm going to give them my people, a pure language. So let us come back to that. Isaiah perhaps is the most preeminent of all the prophets in terms of his intellect. When you read the book of Isaiah, you see poetry, you see prose, you see elocution, you see diction, you see all these kind of things, and no prophet, none of the prophets come near to him in terms of how he has presented to us the word. The man is royalty. He is the grandson of King Joash, which makes him a cousin to King Uzziah, and therefore, the man was born in the palace, and he grew up in the courts of the king. He had access to several kings, and he counseled king. And so you know exactly who you're dealing with when you read the book of Isaiah. He's a public spokesman of Yahweh. He's not a man with erasable personality. He is not easily provoked. That's not Isaiah. Neither is he incorrigible or petty. He does not 
abhor spiteful contagion. Rather, the prophet is adroit in his speech. His elocution, which is elegant in its perspicuity, the man is just eloquent. His juxtapositional theme about Israel and Judah is enunciated with perfect diction and syntax. You can tell as you read through, and these are all his themes are germane to the urgency of the circumstances in which he lived. That's the prophet. Isaiah. And Isaiah is in a situation where he's speaking of Judah. He's warning Judah and Jerusalem. And to that subject, he writes. But let's go back to when Isaiah was called. Because all of us can remember at some point when Yah spoke to us where we were and how we responded. I remember my situation quite clearly. I was in the betting shop. It was a Sabbath afternoon and it was the last race of the day. And I was back in the last horse that's called Three Chances. I remember my calling. And, and you remember yours to where you were when it was the first time you clearly, with a heartfelt need to respond to the king's call. And so let's go to chapter 6 of the book. Of Yeshuhau. In the year that the sovereign Yuziyahu, you see what the English have done again. Yuziyahu, that's his name. We say Uzziah. In the year that sovereign Yuziyahu died, I saw Yahweh sitting. On a throne, high and lifted up, and the th train of his robe filled the echo. The echo, that's the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Kodesh, that's holy. Kodesh, Kodesh is Yahweh of hosts. All the earth is filled with his esteem, his glory. And the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Did you hear that? We must hold to these thoughts. This was a worship. And this was where Isaiah, Yeshuahu, saw Yah in the temple. And he's letting you know that the worshipers were not timid. They were not timorous. When they sang the door moved. That's the kind of energy, that's the kind of interest they took in bringing glory. We sing, you know, we bring that sacrifice of praise. They had brought theirs, and look how they gave it to him at a time when his presence filled the whole temple. And Isaiah, Yeshuahu, was so smothered by what he saw, overwhelmed by the presence of Yah, he cried out, Woe is me. I am undone, he says. Uh, verse 5 And I said, Woe to me, I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. My eyes 
of seeing the suffering. He wants you to know that he had seen Yah. My eyes had seen. And it, was just, it wasn't just his physical eye. He had seen Yah through his mind's eye. It was a reality for him. Worship on that day was different from all the other time that Isaiah had met Yah. It was different. He said, my eyes had seen him. I had seen the suffering, Yahweh of hosts. And one of the seraphs flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which had been taken from the thongs of the altar. Understand something. Isaiah is about to have his lips here cauterized. Are you with me? Burned. And, and, and don't think this is in the vision. This is real. This really happened to Isaiah. That the coal was put on his lips. And thereafter he went about with scorched lips speaking to the people. This was literal. Having his lips cauterized. Are you with me? And we so wish sometimes that the things that come out of our mouths, the things we speak and the things we say, how is it we don't come to the attention of the word saying our lips needs to be cauterized? He said that. And the, the seraphim touched my mouth, he said, with it, and said, See, this has touched your lips, your wickedness is taken away, and your sin is covered. Wow. Now, let's stop there, because I started out, and I presented to you, a royal prophet. A lot of the prophets in the scriptures are people of ordinary standing. They are from, you know, sheep herders and goat herders and, and people like Amos, you know, who are there ripening um, fruits and all those kind of thing. But Isaiah was an esteemed man. And he's called by Yah. But I'm showing you that Yah does not have any partiality. Because it says, even though he was raised in the courts of the king, and he was born in the palace, his lips were not right. He was a man of unclean lips. And we remain people of unclean lips, unless our lips too are cauterized, by the seraphims sent by Yah to cleanse us from our sins. And so the word tells us in verse 8. And I heard, said the prophet, the voice of Yahweh saying, Whom do I send? And who? would go for us. Did you get that? Let's read that again. Let's emphasize the point. Because the last time you read that, perhaps you missed it. Isaiah, Yeshu Ahu, Yahu, said, and I heard the voice of Yahweh saying, whom do I send? You recognize the singular there, because we're dealing with the plural one. Who do I send, said Yah. Then he said, and who will go for us, the plural one. So Isaiah is giving you a glimpse here of that which they call the Trinity, the plural one. He's saying, I and then you, us. In that very verse, don't miss it. 
And he said, Go, and you shall say to the people, Hearing, you hear, but do not understand, and seeing, you see, but you do not know. Did you get that? Make the heart of the people fat, and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and shall turn and be healed. Let's deconstruct those sentences. Isaiah is told, go and speak to the people, but don't assume, Isaiah, that when you speak to them, you're going to be successful. Their hearts are going to become much harder. Their eyes are going to be such that they will not see. So I'm going to use you, Isaiah, to speak to these people, but they will not understand. I will make them not understand. You are not going to be successful. Wow. Just think. That you're a preacher, you're called by Yah, and he sends you to a people, and you're going to be doing this for a number of years, but he says, you're not going to be successful in that they will believe you, in that they will come to baptism, in that they will accept the word. It's not going to happen, Isaiah. Wow. He says, the more you speak to them, the harder their hearts will be. And more scales will come on their hide. They will not see. And, and you can see this and link it with Yeshua and Paul. Because when Yeshua came, Yeshua said, I will speak to them in parables just in case they understand and come. So he was quoting from Isaiah at that particular point. I speak to you in power. He says, those of my disciples, they will understand in the parables that I speak with them. But you, Isaiah, you're going to speak to these people in Judah. Even as down in the end times, the preacher will speak to the people, but the people will not respond. You can see the parallel. The same thing that happened in Isaiah's time is going to happen, is happening in our time. It doesn't matter how you tell people to keep the Sabbath or to keep the feast days. They will go their own way. Isaiah, they will not hear you. They have delinquent ears and they have eyes they see, but they cannot see Isaiah. And that's how it's going to be. So... If you were told that, to go and preach to people, to witness to them, to be an evangelist to them as Isaiah, Yeshuahu, how would you respond? How would you respond? Well, listen to what Isaiah said in, chapter, in verse 11. Then I said, Yahweh, until when? How long do I do this? How long must I continue speaking to a people who do not have any interest in what I'm saying? And, and it reminds me very much sometimes when you write to people, you send emails, you send WhatsApps, and you perhaps think this thing will alarm them. This thing will drive them to an interest in what is happening around them and certainly come to ya. But they don't bat an eyelid. They ask questions that they do not have any interest in. The answer that you give them. It was like that in Isaiah's time. And sometimes we get to the point where we say, well, I'm not going to do this again. But Yah says, Isaiah, you're going to do this. On t well, let's read it. Because Isaiah wants to know, how long do I preach this message to the people who are not going to hear me? 
Let's read verse 11 again. Then I said, Yahweh, until when? And he answered, Yahweh, answered Yeshua, until the cities of the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, and the houses are without a man, and the land is laid waste and ruined. He said, Do it until they're totally destroyed. Do it. It's a weakness against them. You're appealing to their conscience. And in that day when I come to judge the wicked, their own conscience will testify against them in that you had gone to them, but they had refused and rejected you, even though it was me uh, who they rejected. That's what is happening even in our time. When you speak to people and they do not want to hear you, they are not listening to you, and they have no interest, yeah, tells Yeshua with the prophet, do it anyhow until the land is waste. So the point here is, Yah is saying, Judah and Israel is going to be destroyed. Are you with me? And, and you well know, of course you know, that after Solomon died as King Solomon, there was a conflict between Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom. And let me just explain that sometimes when you read the scriptures, the scripture uses Israel denotatively as the northern kingdom. And it also uses Israel connotatively as the whole of Israel and Judah together. And it also uses Ephraim as a synonym to refer to the largest tribe in the north. So we have to understand exactly when we use the term Israel, whether we are using it denotatively connotatively or we're using Ephraim as a synonym we must understand that because the conflict is between the northern tribe and the southern tribe so Yeshua the prophet Isaiah having been given the approval now to go to the people even though he knows that not going to hear him he still has to go because what? The word of Yah sends him to go. The voice of Yah says go. Go to the people and you will preach until they are totally destroyed. Wow. So when we get flustered and disappointed with people not hearing us, listening to us, Yah says continue to do it until they are destroyed. So Isaiah now picks himself up. You better join me in chapter 7. Chapter 7 of the book of Isaiah. The word here says, And it came to pass in those days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah and Judah, that Rezim is the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remalia, the king of Israel, went up towards Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. Did you get me? You notice the kind of people Isaiah, Yeshua, was dealing with. He's not dealing with commoners. Let me read it again for the emphasis. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin the king of Syria, and Pekah the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up towards Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. Understand what's happening here. As I indicated earlier, there is a split after Solomon died. And the ten northern tribes 
have now joined an alliance with Syria to fight against their own brother, Judah. That's what's happening here. And it was told the house of David, David, saying Syria is confederate with Ephraim. So we see here Ephraim being used as the synonym for the northern tribe. Or tribes, I should say. Right? These are the ten tribes. Now when that news broke and reached the house of David, can you imagine the consternation? Can you imagine how they felt that the ten tribes that are supposed to be brothers of Judah are now joining forces with a foreign enemy to come against their own brother. That's the situation that Yah sends Yahu to warn the people. Then, verse 3, said Yahweh unto Yeshuahu, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, to meet the king, thou, and Shear Jeshub, thy son, at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller field. Now, understand something that Yeshuahu, Isaiah here, he has two sons, two prophetic sons. The first one means that Jerusalem will be rooted, will be destroyed. And the other means that a remnant will return. This prophetic. So he's gone to Ahaz and he wants Ahaz to know don't worry about this. And Ahaz is thinking to himself, but we are only a small group of people in the south. How are we going to fight against our ten tribes relatives in the north who have joined with Syria? How? Verse 4. And say unto him, Yahweh speaks to Isaiah and tells him, Take heed and be quiet. Tell Ahaz to be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted, for the two tails of these smoking firebrands for the fierce anger of resin with Syria and of son Remalia, because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Remalia have taken evil counsel against thee. They're, they're plotting evil against you, southern tribe, but, but don't worry. Why? Let us go up against Judah. This is what they're saying, and besiege it. And let us make a breach therein for us and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tobiel. Now understand something. As I think of this, I like to bring reality and show its relevance to the times in which we live. And you can think of that in terms of the civil war that took place in America, where the North and the South were fighting in order to liberate or to sustain the chains on the ankles of the slaves. The South did not want to let go these hewers of woods and drawers of water. They wanted them to be their own people in that sense that they belonged to them, change their names, even their religion, and even their God, and give them something, uh, but we will keep them, and the North says not so. And so there was a civil war. And so it was then. It's not new. It is not new. But you can rest assured that you will be emancipated by the king of 
the universe. And, and that's the point that Isaiah was supposed to take to Ea. Don't worry. You and Ya are the majority. Don't look at the crowd. Don't look at the number of people that they have. And, and, and Isaiah, I remember your ministry that the people are not going to hear you. They're not going to believe you. And, and that will give Isaiah ample evidence and incentive to bind up the testimony. Are you with me? That's my subject. He gets to the point where nobody is listening and it's going to be said, bind up the, te the testament and seal up the law and give it to my disciple. No, not anybody else. Give it to the disciple. They have use for it. Are you following me? And so you can feel that incipient anger in Isaiah. Can't you not? And you can feel the angst. But Yah tells him, go to the king. Go to the king. Go to Ahaz. Go to the king and let him know, don't worry. Verse 7. Thus saith Yahweh Elohim, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. That which they're planning against you? Because they have more people, they have more members in their church, it won't stand. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin, and within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that is to be not to be a nation. Did you hear me? Yah says, Isaiah, within 65 years. Hear me? Isaiah, your son who was just born, by the time he gets to pensionable age, the same people who Ephraim is joining with will take them into captivity within 65 years. It will not be a nation. It will not stand. All that they're planning, those who will not attend your assembly because they like the large assembly and the large churches. Remember, I'm with you. Remember that. Tell the king, give the king that message. That within 65 years, that which he's afraid of now, the alliance between Ephraim and Syria, it won't happen because there will be no northern kingdom by that time. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria, this is verse 9, is Ramalia, son. If he will not believe, it is because you are not stable. Did you hear me? Let me say that another way. When I tell you that the feast days are supposed to be kept, because Yah had pre-selected these days, these holy days I should qualify for his people to come, his family to come and worship him, and you say they are done away with. When I tell you that the Sabbath is the fourth commandment, it is the Decalogue, and if you offend in one point, you are guilty in all of them, therefore the Sabbath must be kept as the total package, and you don't believe that, Yah here says, it's because you're unstable. You're unstable. Verse 10, moreover, Yahweh speak again, Yahweh spake again to whom? Moreover, Yahweh spake again unto Hahaz, saying, Hast thee a sign of Yahweh, thy Elohim? Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. The king doesn't believe, so the king gets a message from Yah through Isaiah. 
If you don't believe what I'm saying, that these people, because they're more numerous than you, cannot take you because I'm with you, then ask for a sign, any sign, and I will let that sign come through. What did the king say? Verse 12. But he has said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt Yahweh. And he said, hear ye now, O house of David, you see, Ahaz doesn't even realize the seat that he occupies. That's the house of David. And the house of David will always have a king on the throne. And Ahaz, you are that person right now. And moreover, when Yahweh comes, the son of David, he's going to come to raise up David's tabernacle. So don't fear because the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh come. Understand that he has asked for a sign. And Yahweh will validate what he said in his words to you. O king, But he said he's not going to ask. Verse 14. Therefore Yahweh himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And his name shall be what? Called Emmanuel. Understand even when we speak of Andal's Messiah. Handel's Messiah comes straight out of the book of Isaiah. Did you know that? You know, at Easter time and sometimes at Christmas, you hear on the radio Handel's Messiah and people are talking about Handel's Messiah. And, but it's come straight out of Handel's Messiah. It comes out of the book of Yeshua, who I should say. Because in 1741, the duke invited Andal to Dublin. The Duke of Devonshire invited Andal to Dublin to write a piece. And a clergyman had written the lyrics to Handel and told him to music to it and within a few weeks two or three weeks Handel finished the piece and brought it back to the clergyman and the clergyman was a little bit annoyed he made sure to tell him that you could not have produced music so quickly and today we sing and people play Handel's Messiah, but it's coming out of the word, the eloquent words of this prophet here, Isaiah. The sign is a virgin will conceive. Are you with me? And when you see that Ahaz, you will know that that which I have spoken to Yeshayahu has come true. My word will not return to me void. A virgin will conceive. You get the point? His name shall be called Emmanuel. But you missed it. Why Emmanuel? What is it that Yah wants Ahaz to know that Ahaz didn't know? Why he named the child in this context. Emmanuel means Yah with us. So Yah is letting Ahaz know, I am with you. I am with the house of David. I am with you regardless of the, the northern tribe and their alliance with Syria, I'm not with them, but I'm with you. And so when the child is born and you hear his name, Emmanuel, you will know Yah is with us. And so it is even today, those of us who are looked down on as nothing, perhaps only as a 
small congregation or a house church. Yeah, says, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with the house of David. So we need to understand that. And he tells you, butter and honey shall he eat, but he may know to refuse evil and choose good. Yet before this child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou dreadest shall be forsaken of both her kings. Did you hear me? Understand what's happening here. You now dread Syria that has two kings. By the time Yeshua, this child that is to be born, is born, Syria will not be the Syria that you know. It will lose its king. He's talking to who? The house of David, Judah. And he's warning Judah the same way that you see Ephraim, the ten tribes, go away. Learn from that experience. Because further north, there is a power. At the time Isaiah was prophesying, Syria was a dominant world power. But down there by Iraq, there was a power developing we called Babylon. That had not yet come into fruition. But now, a hundred years subsequent to Israel being taken, Judah himself will be taken by Nebuchadnezzar. But he's letting Judah know, don't worry. Don't form an alliance with anybody. Because Yah is with you. Are you with me? And, and, and that's a salient message for us today. You hear people say, let's come together in an, an ecumenical setting where we come to worship Yah. Sunday and Sabbath come together. Yah says, no. No, don't, don't join an alliance with them. Didn't you see the sign, the sign of the child that was born and his name is Emmanuel and Emmanuel means Yeah, he's with us. And moreover, Asa, understand, where is the child born? The child is born in Bethlehem of Judea in the city of David, which is Yeshua, the master. He's born in your house. He's born, he's the house of bread. So don't worry because this is a sign. You wouldn't ask for a sign, but I gave you a sign. Are you with me? So as we read the book of Yeshuhau, we must understand something not only is it about conflict between factions it is about true worship against false worship let me say that again it is about those who worship Yah in spirit and truth and those who worship by means of tradition. You do it because people have always done it. Not because it's true. So come with me to the book of Chronicles. Second Chronicles. And we will look at the 11th portion of the book of Chronicles. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he gathereth of the house of Judah and Benjamin 
an hundred and four score thousand chosen men, which were warriors to fight against Israel that he might bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam. You understand what's happening? I spoke earlier about the conflict that developed after the death of Shalomon or Solomon. So you have this and, and, and it is such a fitting word this morning for us to bisect and deconstruct and learn from in terms of how circumstances impact and impose upon our lives. Judah wants to make sure that the true worship remains in Judah. And so what, what is Judah going to do? They're going to attack Israel. So he gets a hundred and four score thousand chosen men, which were warriors to fight against Israel, that he might bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam. We want the kingdom together. We don't want a division. So we're going to fight them. But the word of Yahweh came to Shemaiah, Shemaiah, or Yah, the man of Elohim, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel in Judah and Benjamin, saying, Thus saith Yahweh, he shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren. Return every man to his house, for this thing is done of me. And they obeyed the words of Yahweh and returned from going against Jeroboam. Don't fight them. They don't believe you. They don't have any interest in what you're teaching them. Do not fight with them. Leave them alone. I want you to understand something here. The northern tribe, well, uh, the distinct difference between the northern and the southern tribe was not because they had 10 people, groups of people, or they were more numerous in number. The 10 northern tribes were in, they were an apostate group. They apostatized. There's not one good king among them. They turned away from the Torah. They were not doing what Yah said. And you will soon see that. Are you with me? And so you're learning something else. That the majority throughout history are usually the apostates. And let me validate that which I am saying. So Yah tells them, don't ever go against your brother. Leave them alone. All right? Come with me now to verse 14 of the same um, chapter. It says, for the Levites left their suburbs. Remember, I think it's in chapter 6 of Joshua. The Levites, they were not given land, but they were given cities. I think they had, in total, from all the tribe, 48 cities. These were cities of refuges. So the Levites were not given land because Yahweh was their inheritance. And so their interest and their investment was in Yah. They were not given land, but they were given cities. Listen to verse 14. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem for Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto Yahweh. Understand where I'm going with this. The Levites are chosen by Yah to be the spokesperson of his word to the people. They were among the apostates. 
But like us, when we recognize where truth is, we must leave the apostate group and go where true worship is. It says the Levites here, they left the north and they went south where the temple was, where the true worship in the house of David was, and so they left. Verse 15, and ordained his priest for the shrines. This is Jeroboam. His priests were not ordained by Yah. They were ordained by him and for the devils. The word said the devils. And for the calves. Are you with me? You see the golden calves? Which he had made. He made two. Listen to verse 16. I never forget verse 16. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto Yahweh, the Elohim of their fathers. The word says, all those who desire to worship in truth, they left the northern tribes and they went south to the tribe of Judah to worship. So let me say this to qualify all that I've said. You have heard it said and I have heard it said and perhaps we have even said it ourselves. When we talk about the ten tribes, lost tribes. The Bible doesn't teach that. Hear me. The Bible doesn't say that 10 tribes were lost or they were scattered. It says all the people who desired true worship came south, including the Levites. So if the Levites came down, you don't any longer have 10 tribes in the north. And he says, all those who desired true worship, they left too. We don't know how many tribes left. So it wasn't 10 tribes that were taken. It was the apostate people who were taken and put into captivity in 722 by the Assyrians. Because all those who desired to worship, they came south. We know Simeon went. So understand what's happening here just like it is now. You know people come and they say, well I like that church because it's vibrant and we like the songs and so on. But is that ch church speaking Yah's word? So what we have to do in our time is to make sure that we are at the place where Yah's word is being spoken. His name is held I. And those who don't like that, they will go north, like Simeon. Remember, Simeon's territory was with Judah, but he, he went north. And Levi, who was with the north, came south. And you have that today, that people who like a particular kind of worship will go to a particular church. And likewise, but the thing that is important here is to make sure you are at the place where he uh, wants you to be. Let me read it again, verse 16. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto Yahweh, to Elohim, of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah. Did you hear that? That's how we build up church growth. That's how we build up the denomination growth. By truth and righteousness, not by numbers alone. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong. Three years for three years, they walked in the way of David and Solomon. Are you with me? So come with me now to, let's go back to the book of Isaiah. The book 
of Isaiah. So let me recap first. So we see Isaiah is called by Yah, and his lips are cauterized to make sure that when he speaks, he speaks truthfully. And he sent to Ahaz, the king of Judah, to let him know, don't fear the threats that are coming from Syria or coming from the northern tribe. Because within 65 years of your son being born, there won't be the 10 tribes and Syria won't be the tribe that you need to think of now or the group of people, the kingdom that you ought to be thinking of is Babylon that is coming up. Babylon at that time was only a wee little um, company. But they are going to be the trouble and they are the ones who are going to come and take Judah into captivity into Babylon. And you pick that up in the book of Daniel. Are you with me? So we, 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 you know, you've got to understand that the, the word of Yah, the, the, the book, it's an integrative message. Everything links and connect. If only the preacher, the teacher, the elder, the deacon can stitch the fabric into a holistic garment. So when you come, you can wear that. That's the point we want to make are you with me and, and so chapter 8 says moreover Yahweh said unto me take thee a great roll and write in it with distinct letters concerning mea shalash ashbaz you understand what's happening here Yahweh is giving a son to Yeshuahu Isaiah and this son, his name is Prophetic. Now, you can imagine this young man in school, can't you? His teacher speaking to him, come here, Maya Shalal Ashbaz. And you can also imagine how it would be to the other children listening to that name. And Isaiah said, and I took unto me Faithful witnesses to record. Uriah the priest and Zachariah the son of Jeburashel. And I went on to the prophetess. His wife is a prophetess. Can you understand? Now, understand what kind of man this is. He's born in the palace. He has access to the kings. And his wife is a prophetess. And he said, he went into the um, prophetess and she conceived and bare a son. Then said Yahweh to me, call his name Mea Shalal Ashbaz. In fact, he was named before he was born. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father, my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoils of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. Did you hear that? Again, he's consolidated the point. He says, before the child is at a certain age, get to a certain age, be able to speak, there will be no Syria. Don't fear. For as much as the people refuse it, the waters of Shiloh. Did you hear me? Understand the language here. Don't miss it. Let me read verse 6 again. Because Yah is very deliberate in terms of how he speaks. There's no throwaway word in the scriptures. He says, for as much as this people refuse the waters of Shiloh. Now, if you read that, he's saying the waters of peace. That's what he's saying. They have refused the waters of peace. When you reject the Sabbath and when you reject the feast day and all the other truth that Yah said, you have rejected the waters of Shiloh, the waters of peace. I've come to you in peace. That go softly. That's how Shiloh River runs, softly. 
and rejoice in Rezim and Remalia's son. Now therefore behold, Yahweh bringeth up upon them the waters of a river. Which river is it? Euphrates! Which is the same Euphrates river that will encircle Babylon that Cyrus will come up in a few years through the bed and kill Belshazzar. That's the rough water. No, you don't want the Euphrates River from bank to bank. You want the rivers of Shiloh. That is obedience to Yah. That's the rivers of peace. Are you with me? And so the prophet is being told this thing. Verse 8. And he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over and he shall reach even to the neck and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of the land. O Emmanuel, God with us. Yeah, with us. Did you get that? He's telling you Israel reject the water of Shiloh, the waters of Shiloh. And he's telling them, be careful, the waters of the Euphrates. That's where Nebuchadnezzar will come from. Verse 9, associate yourself, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces, and give here, O ye a far country, gird yourself, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourself, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Take yourself together, and it shall come to north. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for El is with you. Yah is with you. Don't forget that. For Yahweh spake thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not, O confederacy, to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye, they fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify Yahweh of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. Don't make a confederacy, an alliance with these people. And he shall be for a sanctuary but for a stone a stumbling for a rock as a fence to both the houses of Israel for a gin and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem now notice what it says here and he shall be a sanctuary but a stone of a stumbling for the rock of a fence when you read of these idioms in the word of Yah, like rock and stone, what does it mean? It means, as theologians will tell you, the expositional constancy. The expositional constancy. What does that mean? It means that when you read of them like a rock throughout the scriptures, it means the same thing. There is an expositional constancy. The rock here that we speak of is no other than the very rock of ages. The very rock that Jacob slept on. The very rock that... Daniel spoke of that will cut out of the holy mountain of Israel and will, in the time of these kings and the last day, will smite them. That is the expositional constancy that we are reading of here in the book of Yeshua. Are you with me? And he wants him to know that though your numbers are small. You're in the south. Right? And you're near to the southwest people in Egypt. And you're not too far from the northeast people, the Assyrian. Don't join with them. Don't make an alliance with them. Because I've given you the sign, Emmanuel, Yah, 
is with you. For Yahweh spake that to me in a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk, this is verse 11, chapter 8, in the way of the people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy. No, don't say that. Rather, sanctify Yahweh. Verse 14. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling. It's like when we read in the, the, the um, Brit Adasha, the New Testament, when Yas Yeshua said, the stones would cry out. <laughs> you know, we, 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 we have a tendency to think that uh, the stones that are out there, like the gravel, the pebble, those are the stones that would speak. But the contextual relevance of that idiom is this. Yahweh is the stone that the builder refused. Yeshua is the stone that the builder refused. And he's a stumbling stone for all those who reject him. Are you with me? So if he is the stone and he is the head... That's the stone. Then the rest of us who follow him are also stones. You may call us pebbles. So he's saying, if you stop them from doing, the stones will cry out. My disciples will cry out. Not the stones that dream all day. And if you ask them why you're dreaming, they say nothing. He's not talking about those pebbles outside. He's talking, so he's using an idiom to emphasize because his disciples who understand parables would know what he's saying, as we know. Are you with me? So verse 15. And many among them shall stumble. Did you hear me? He said that the masses will stumble in the last days that they did in the time of Yeshua. And when they stumble, what will they do? They will fall. That's what the word says. And be broken, and be snared, and be taken. Understand, I'm trying to link the contextual relevance of our time back to Isaiah. The masses of the people will stumble. They will fall and they will be taken captive. Not necessarily in the same way that the children of Israel were taken captive. Today we have people in slavery, technological slavery, pharmaceutical slavery, medical slavery, that they will trap them. Remember last week when we studied we said the people were drinking wormwood. What is the wormwood that they were drinking? That caused a third of them to die. Remember that? So we look at the function rather than what happened in that time. It is the function of the reality that we'll, we must look at. People are going to be made slaves again not necessarily in chains on their ankles, but more so on their minds. Psychological, emotional slavery. That's what the word here is trying to tell us. So, Isaiah, who had been called to go to the people and to preach to them he well knew that his task was one in which the people would not listen to him. Rather, their hearing would become dull. They are dullards. He wasn't preaching to the people who were hearing. Are you with me? He was preaching to people who did not want to hear and felt that their strength was in numbers. So they would join with the large congregations. That's the point I'm driving home for you to get it. 
Israel joined with Syria to fight his own brother. Hear me. And I say this delicately. We have denominations that preach the word of Yah. True. We have that. We see pockets of that around. There are many prophets who are hidden by Hobediah, even though Elijah may not know where they are, there are pockets of people preaching the word of Yah. But because there are only small pockets of them, those in the large churches think very little of them. And in risable tones, they denigrate them. And they would rather join an alliance with the larger congregations. So Isaiah is told, the prophet Yeshua Yahweh was told, go and speak to the people, warn them of their situation and let them know what the outcome is going to be. But understand, Isaiah, that the people that you're preaching to, they won't hear you. Isaiah, your ministry is going to be like that of Noah. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the end time of the coming of Yeshua. It's going to be that. People are not going to listen. The masses of the people are going to be doing their own thing. They are not going to be having an interest in what you're saying. They are preoccupied. They do not have your diction. They do not have your desire. They do not frame the reality of what you're saying into their reality. They are not motivated by the same stimulus that motivates you. Understand that, Isaiah. But do the work anyhow. Speak the word, because the people are incorrigible. Meaning, you cannot correct them. They have a tendency to be incorrigible. Are you with me? So, Isaiah, Understand that they have an inordinate irascibility, these people. And you cannot change them from what they're doing. You, Isaiah, you are a self-effacing man. You do not put yourself up to be recognized. We know you are from good stock. But you are a humble man. But go and preach. To these dullards. And you are going to preach for years. But they won't hear you. They won't hear you. And so Isaiah is presenting to us as a prefiguring of what will happen in the end time. You will have two groups of people. You'll have a small group which he calls the remnant. And you will have a mass of people who are in apostasy. Who have deviated from the Torah. Are you with me? Those are the signs. And you say, well, what are the signs? Well, one of the signs is they don't even refer to the sovereign Yah by his proper name. They don't keep the Shabbat. 
they don't keep the feast days. They are in apostasy. They are in rebellion like the northern tribe. And Isaiah in chapter 8 and verse 20 says, If they speak not according to the word, the written word, there is no what? No light. You can read. They teach that Messiah was born on Christmas, which is Nimrod's son's birthday. They keep Easter when Yah says Passover should be kept. These people, like Jeroboam, are in apostasy. And it is the apostate ones that were taken by Assyria in 722 because all those who were with them who desired worship, we are told in 2 Chronicles 11, they came south. They came to the temple and worship. So when the angel of Revelation 18, 4 said, come out. Come out of her, my people. Come out from where? Come out from Israel. Apostate Israel. And come in to southern Israel. That's what he's saying. Come to the house of David. It is the house of David, the tabernacle of David, that Yahweh is going to restore at the end of time. But we conceptualize that to mean that Yahweh is saying, come out of one denomination into another. No, it is within the context of Israel that we have the distinction. The northern tribes are in apostasy. Come down south to the house of David. And interestingly, as you come down south, you have to come up to Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is up on a hill, incandescent light. A house that is up on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light so shine, therefore, so your Father in heaven may be glorified. Are you with me? That's what the word is telling us. A remnant shall return. And so we see through Zerubbabel, through Ezra and Nehemiah, a remnant did return in that situation. But remember here when Isaiah was speaking, it was several hundred years before Messiah came. And he's telling them, the sign is, the sign is that a virgin shall give birth, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, and Emmanuel means Yah with us. So when you know the child is born, you know Judah, that Emmanuel is a sign that Yah is with you. So when Yah is with you, don't join any alliance with anybody. If you only have three or four people in your congregation, just, just worship. You have a quorum. And so understand this also. Understand this also. That if you follow the trajectory of Isaiah's ministry, Isaiah is telling them that this child, this son, this lamb is a sign. And when the child grew up the child wants you to know that Judah is going to be destroyed again so in Matthew chapter 24 he said when you see Jerusalem is surrounded flee hear me so we come to understand that the Israelites who heard that at the time, the Shemite Negro Israelites, they went to Africa, to Ghana, to Guinea, to the land of Judah. Hear me? Hear me? There were two groups of Israelites. Hear me? You had the wealthy Israelites, Shemite Israelites, 
and you had the ordinary people. And those with the wealth went to Ghana, went to Guinea, and it was there that they were picked up in West Africa and brought to the Americas and brought to Britain. And they answered to, Jeremiah, to Isaiah's prophecy, a remnant will return. Because what happened in the first remnant through Zerubbabel and Nehemiah and Ezra will happen in the end time. You better come with me. You know what's interesting about the book of um, Isaiah? It's a miniature Bible. It has 37 chapters that deals and then that deals with the Old Testament, and then 27 chapters that deals with the New Testament, just like the Bible itself. And you notice that Paul and Yeshua, they always borrow from Isaiah. Isaiah is um, in the 66 books, just like the Bible. And, and, and so it's very, very interesting. If you really want to know the Bible, read Isaiah. Because all the quotes we get come from Isaiah. Yeshua always borrows from Isaiah. So, understand something here. Let, let, let me um, validate a little bit more the point that I just made. Come with me to 2 Chronicles. And we will dilate upon chapter 35. Moreover, Josiah, this should be Josiah, kept a Passover unto Yahweh in Jerusalem, and they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. And he set the priests in their charges and encouraged them to serve of the house of Yahweh. Verse 3, and said unto the Levites that taught all Israel, which were holy unto Yahweh, put the holy ark in the house, which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, did build. It shall not be a burden upon, upon your shoulders. Serve now Yahweh your Elohim and his people Israel. Now, Josiah here wants the ark into the temple. Clearly, the, the ark was not there. Hear me? Understand where I'm going. This is King Josiah. And you know how young he was when he took the throne, eight years old, right? And years later, he realizes that the ark is not in the temple. So he commissions the priest to go and get the ark and bring it back in the temple. Where was the ark? The ark was in Elephantine Island in Egypt. Who took it there? The priest. Hear me. The priest who left the north and came south realized that under the reign of Manasseh, things had gone woefully bad. And so they took the ark and brought it to Elephantine Island in Egypt and they built a temple there and were worshipping in Egypt. And later on the ark was transported from Egypt to Aksum in Africa. I know that doesn't sound very well. They don't want you to know that. Because if you know that, you will know who you are. Are you with me? But remember this. We believe in the priesthood of believers. Let me say that again. We believe in the priesthood of believers because we're under the Melchizedek order of worship where everybody is a priest according to the call that was made in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5 and 6. Come, and if you be obedient to me, you will be a what? A kingdom of priests. Now, let me link this. <laughs> Remember the priest in that conflict between the north and the south, 
they recognized what true worship was. So they left the north, they left that congregation, and they came south where Yah's present was. What's my point? My point is, if you are part of the kingdom of priests, you too should know what true worship is. And you would come out from where you are and come into the truth where he has presently, where his name is esteemed and where his truth is told. Come out from Ur, my people. Come out. Because you're in Babylon. It's not Assyrian anymore. It's Babylon. Mr. Babylon. And you're so mystified that you don't even know it. And so when you read Acts chapter 8 and you see that Ethiopian eunuch coming from worship in Jerusalem, you don't need to wonder anymore. That's your ancestor. He understood. He was reading from what? The book of Isaiah. That's where he was reading from. And he wanted to know, well, who is it that they're talking about? And he asked sent the Holy Spirit to Philip to explain to him. He's talking about what? Well, that child that was born and his name shall be called what? Emmanuel. That's the child. You know, and, and, and that's why Isaiah said, what well, Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 9. And verse 6, what does he say? Tell us, somebody. Isaiah 9 and verse 6. He says, for unto us, what happened? A child is born, and unto us, eh? And the government shall be upon his? A government is up on his shoulder. Are you with me? And what else? What does it say? Read it, read it. You know, say it. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Wonderful. What else? Counselor. Counselor. What else? The mighty one? Yeah. The mighty Yah. What else? The everlasting father. Yes? Let me make another point there. In Isaiah 9 and verse 6, we're told his name shall be called Wonderful. So we know who this is, don't we? Yes? So come with me to Judges. Judges chapter 13, because we understand Samson, don't we? And how he allowed his reliance upon his physical strength to deny him the wisdom to understand the source of his spiritual strength. And so when the angel of Yah came to his mother and said, you're going to have a child. And this child is going to be strong and he must restrain himself and you must restrain yourself from certain food. Go back to Genesis 1.29 and eat those foods. Are you with me? And the father was not there, but he wanted to know. And he wanted to know the name of the angel that came. Are you with me? And he asked the angel the name. And the angel of Yah said unto him, Why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. <laughs> Are you with me? That's what he says. He said, My name is wonderful, which takes us back to Isaiah. So who is it that appeared unto Samson's mother? Yeshua himself. Don't ask my name, because my name is wonderful. So, the word is this. Revelation chapter 22, come with me there. And verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say what? Come. 
And let him that hear it say what? Come. And let him that is a thirst do what? Come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely, the rivers of Shalom, freely. Come. And the angel continues to call in Revelation 18 and verse 4. Come, what? Out of her, my people. But they're not hearing. Because what? Just like in Isaiah's time, the hearing is dull. Matthew 22, verse 1 to 3, And Yeshua answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servant to call them that were bidden to the wedding. But what happened? They did not come. They did not come. So today we send the message out to the byways and to the hedges because we see people building political alliances and ecumenical alliances and they are not as self-effacing as Isaiah was. They think their strength is in numbers. Why? Because they have not accepted Emmanuel. Yah is with us. Yah is with us. When you accept him, you don't care about building alliances with other people. Because you know that all you have to do is to obey him. So, Yeshuhau, the prophet, the kingly prophet, the royal prophet, the prophet whose wife is a prophetess, he was raised in the courts, he had access to king, he preached with a lips, a set of lips that were cauterized by the seraphim from the holy temple, when he realized that the people wouldn't hear, he asked, how long should I preach this thing? He said, until the land have made ways. He said, all right, and he preached. Then, said he, bind up the testimony. Bind it up, fold up the scrolls, fold it up. Seal up the law and give it to my disciples. Give it to those who believe because I ask these things and I say these things in the name of Yeshua, I pray. Amen.